knowing that Anna's time is, is precious and we've started very promptly, so I'm going to think that I'm going to be handing over shortly to, to Anna. It's lovely to have you join us. Thank you very much. Anna O'Neill joined University of Southampton in 2019 and the poor woman barely had time to get her feet under the table before all hell broke loose and COVID launched. And so, my goodness, what a, what a baptism of fire in a, in a relatively new position. So I'm delighted to have Anna join us as, uh, I'm just going to get your correct title, as Director of Library Services and Arts Strategy, University Librarian at the University of Southampton. Anna, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. It's lovely to have you with us. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to do my best to now try and share my screen. Um, well, again, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, this talk is going to reflect on some of the changes that have happened in the last year. Um, and it's really trying to look for some of the good that's come out of this, uh, this awful crisis. So I take a very optimistic point of view um, as I kind of move through the talk. And it may well be that that's kind of countered by uh, this afternoon's uh, talk about um, just because we can doesn't mean we should. Um, but we're, we're going to be in a happy place for this, uh, this presentation. Uh, so that's, uh, that's me. I'm the Director of Library and Arts here at the University of Southampton. And um, I'm going to just talk about uh, kind of five different areas. Uh, some are going to be in more depth than others. But really, it's uh, with a view of how we can build on what's happened uh, as we move into the future. Um, I'm also just going to kind of give a kind of brief overview of our, my slides as we go, because it gives you a little bit of insight into uh, the University of Southampton. So this is uh, Noriko from our uh, library at the Winchester School of Art. And you can see there uh, we've got our COVID measures in place with the barriers and face masks and gloves and all the other bits and pieces. Um, so just a little bit about the University of Southampton. Uh, we are a research intensive university and a Russell Group University. Uh, we're in the top 15 in the United Kingdom and top 100 internationally. Um, and we have a Malaysia campus. We've got five libraries in the UK, one of which is our University Health Library with approximately uh, 23,000 students and, um, and almost 140 library staff as well. So that's a little bit where we have to kind of sell the university every time we do a presentation so, um, and a beautiful view of the campus there. Um, so like most services, over the last year, we've moved from fully remote working to a more hybrid model. Um, and I'm just going to quickly cover what we did. So all of our inquiry services moved online. I think that's probably true for everybody at some point. And so did all of our training. And we were forced into uh, creating innovative new um, areas like digital reading room for archives. Um, we also had to significantly change our buildings. Um, so we are operating uh, with social distancing at two meter plus. Uh, we created a one way system. Uh, we've got cleaning stations and a requirement for face masks. And the picture here shows um, our temporary library entrance uh, because we needed to close our main entrance in order to manage our one way system. And after watching our, our poor students get soaked in the rain uh, for, for many weeks, uh, we eventually managed to put up a temporary shelter to um, look after them while they were waiting to come into the library, uh, which is what you can see on the screen. At various uh, stages, we introduced new service models um, as, reg uh, as regulations changed. Um, so we really upped our digitization services and that was extended to quite a bit. Um, we introduced free postal returns um, in order to try and get some of our book stock back. We're still trying to do that. Um, and I know that other services are, are in the same, same position. And we started to advertise our rather secret postal loan service. So it was something that we were already doing. It just, uh, as it turned out, nobody really knew that we were offering that as a service. We broke down our services into three areas, uh, which allowed us to affect, um, depending on government guidelines. Um, and we were let loose on our alliteration here. So we had great fun with this one with our click and collect, uh, kind of pretty standard, browse and borrow and sit and study. <laughs> um, the ability to move up and down that spectrum uh, not only meant that we were able to flex given the kind of differences in government guidance. So as things, uh, knockdowns came and went, but also um, it allowed us to flex when the unexpected happens. And the picture here is of a flood that we had in our health services library relatively recently. 
um, it was a, a pipe that broke. And uh, in that case, we had open for all of our services. We were able to adapt quickly and uh, move back to our click and collect service while we were trying to, to pull up the tiles or estates team were trying to pull up the tiles for us. And so that in itself has been one of the benefits that's come out of COVID. Uh, we've able to be really kind of specific about the services that we're offering and then actually be able to move in an adaptive and flexible style. Um, and I think that is something that we can take into the future um, with us. So flexible working has obviously been a really kind of important part of COVID. And I'm going to pause for a while here because I think it would be really interesting to consider what this might mean for the, for the future. Because the last year has really felt like the largest ever experiment in new ways of working and flexible working. Um, so as I've said, throughout the year, we've either been working remotely or in a hybrid way. Uh, we've had some, some of the team on site, uh, some of the team off site permanently, and some people doing both. So myself included. So I'm, I'm actually in my office today, um, but I spend three days a week working from home. And although this, this uh, way of working isn't without its problems, it has proved, um, I think for us all, uh, that it is possible to work in a different way. Um, and for us, we'd already started this discussion. So we'd be, we'd, we as a team had been having a really quite in-depth discussion about flexible working. Um, it was triggered for us by a need to think about how we uh, offer consistency um, of the application and interpretation of our HR policies. So certainly here at the University of Southampton, the, our HR, HR policies often refer to line manager decision making. Um, and we had had lots of discussions about how we make that line manager decision making kind of fair and equitable. Um, I'm sure you've probably had these discussions too, um, because they quite often end up in a discussion about why some roles can work from home and why others can't. And I think probably with a slight sense of grievance uh, that if you're in a role which can't work from home, for instance, you might be needed to kind of fulfill an inquiry rotor, inquiry desk rotor or something like that, um, that that doesn't feel particularly fair. Um, but working remotely forced us to redesign some roles um, as we shifted to an entirely, entirely digital uh, and virtual inquiry service. And I think it's really worth us just taking the time to uh, consider that before we return to old ways of working. And this is a piece of work that we're doing as a university at the moment. And whether there are options for permanently redesigning roles to allow staff the opportunity for that blended working. Um, so this might mean that some roles have a face-to-face -face duties, um, but also duties that could be delivered remotely. Or alternatively, that our offer changes and so that we move to more digital services and less face-to-face -face services. I could see a future where we have a screen on the desk, which is uh, connecting th our, our users through to our uh, team members for, through Teams. And certainly we've seen that um, some universities have really kind of picked up their use of Alexa and that kind of voice activated um, inquiry service. So it might seem a stretch to, to be able to offer those kind of hybrid roles or even um, online only roles, but I really do think it might help improve our attractiveness as an employer. So most universities recruit from probably a like 20 to 30 mile circle around them. Um, here at Southampton, our recruitment market is pretty much halved because half of our circle is the sea. Um, and so we can struggle to recruit to some posts. And I think in general, a lot of libraries struggle to fill um, some specialists or uh, particularly digital posts. So what if we could have recruitment without borders um, and we could extend our market kind of nationally, but also maybe internationally? It, up, it offers up a kind of recruitment possibility um, if we never expect a member of staff to ever come on campus, but it could help us to kind of fill some of those vital skills gaps. And I do recognize the, the issues of time differences and tax issues, which we're kind of going through with some of our, our staff at the moment who've got stuck in other countries, um, but also online induction. Um, but international companies are already working this way. So there are exemplars that we can, we can, we can draw on. And we know that continuing to work in hybrid ways, we kind of more people maybe return to campus um, or to our libraries. Uh, that we'll need to alter our physical spaces. Um, so our office spaces need to be technology enabled. 
probably with docking stations and if shared, maybe kind of uh, lockers and options to book in advance. I mean, none of this is new, Imperial are already doing it, um, for example. Um, but we could also share those spaces outside of the library. And that could allow us to connect with other teams or to choose our preferred location. So we don't necessarily have to go to um, one campus if we've got more than one of them or one library. But importantly, it could free up space to give back to our users. So if our offices became student space, it could become student spaces. And certainly we found that um, we moved to online learning. So all of our uh, teaching moved online, um, but the students didn't then move to individual study in order to do that online learning. And we had a repeated, repeated request for spaces where they could sit kind of within the household bubble um, and watch and, or take part in online learning together. So there's definitely that need for space and different kinds of space. And we can't talk about a new ways of working without talking about Teams or Zoom. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is a, a, a discussion that's kind of very live. I think we're all very heartily sick of Teams, uh, but to take the positive, it has meant for us that we've been able to connect more effectively when someone's, um, whatever somebody's location, and also that we've managed to connect better with our weekend and evening workers. Um, and I would say just in general, um, kind of for, for the managers who are out there, uh, that we did have to let go. We had to kind of trust our staff. We had to um, trust that things were happening and it was kind of okay. Um, so there's definitely a, there was definitely a lesson there about uh, the ability to let go. And uh, the image I've got on the screen there is uh, one of our students' inventions. So we have a student innovation lab at the university and they've designed uh, some wearable tech that then shows where you are on a map, uh, which I think is just ingenious. I'm just going to dwell for a little while on, um, on research, just very lightly, um, because I think it's really interesting that COVID has shown us that it's possible to provide uh, research uh, kind of fast and free. And um, that's because there has definitely been a will to do that. Uh, the first research paper was available just 20 days after the first uh, COVID case was confirmed. Um, and by May 2020, we had 850 preprints published every week. Um, so that's a huge amount of information and research that um, became available for free and in a way that supported text mining and machine learning. Uh, so there is an alternative model and we should really continue to work hard for open access because it does prove that it can be done. Um, there are also um, calls for copyright extension and that worked. Um, that's been extended again to July 2022. And it'll be really interesting to see um, if research shows that that had a negative uh, impact on our authors or if it could have a long-term benefit. And that this is something that could be extended for, um, for a longer period of time. And I have um, just referenced uh, kind of REF, so the Research Excellent Framework, because uh, amidst all of this stuff did get done and REF has been delivered. Um, and I've, I've picked up a, a picture here of our poet in residence um, for the art side of what we do, which is at the John Hensard Gallery, who is going to be delivering a poem on REF um, to celebrate that outcome. The images here um, sh also show a local temp uh, how uh, data visualization has um, been used within the library. So local temperature data has been used to knit a blanket, which has charted the da daily high temperature for every day in 2020. Um, and it's, this is usually displayed in the library. So we have a love data week um, and we had to find other ingenious ways of doing this. So uh, one of the team members who created this has hung it from her window. Um, and taken photos and shared it on social media. I'm sure like many of you that I spent um, quite a bit of the first lockdown uh, telling people that the library service was not closed, it was just the building. Um, and I think that that in itself has been a bit of a step change for libraries as well, that kind of realization that we are more than a building. Um, but also COVID allowed us to kind of get on with some things that we were talking um, about for a while. So we'd been having a kind of live discussion about how we could improve and extend our online inquiry services. Um, and we were, we were still in the point of talking, I would say when COVID hit, um, but somehow because we had to, 
uh, we managed to train up new team members and we did that um, uh, remotely. Um, because they were new, we introduced new quality control um, procedures to make sure that we our uh, students and other users were getting um, the good responses to their questions. And we also extended our opening hours. So we had been delivering that in a very much kind of nine to five model. And that then extended into the evening and weekend. We'd also been planning to do more online training uh, for some time. And although we would um, never really have wanted to do this uh, this way, we managed to do that in two weeks, um, which had been a discussion for, for many months before that. Um, we also delivered online induction and online welcome weeks. Um, and so things that we'd been inching uh, towards and really kind of, you know, mulling over and kind of giving ourselves plenty of space to deliver suddenly massively accelerated to positive effect. We also introduced online bookings. Um, and uh, here are the uh, results of our uh, space survey that we did on the back of those online bookings. So at the bottom of the online booking form, we asked people to tell them to tell us about uh, their experience. Um, so online bookings have definitely been a mixed experience for us, um, and I'm not sure that we have met our student needs, uh, although our survey results did allow us to, um, to flex and to uh, deliver some changes that they'd asked for. Um, having said that, we did get a healthy kind of four and a half star rating out of five, um, and it gave us the benefit of a kind of quick pulse survey. Um, and you can see that some of the feedback we received kind of positively was around cleaning stations and the one-way system. And some old um, old asks came back, which was temperature of space were either too hot or too hot or cold, and the need for more plugs and screens. Um, but I think the lesson I took from, from this um, is that our booking system that we had was inadequate for the scale of what we needed to do. And so we had to let it go. Um, and I think that that was a realization that we, again, had been mulling for quite some time and we never really quite like letting anything go, um, but we did. Um, but it also taught us really maybe to work with what is available. So um, we use Microsoft uh, booking system. It's definitely not perfect. Um, and we kind of, it's not customizable in the way we want to, but it did get it done. And I think there's probably a lesson there for us as well that as librarians, I think we always want to customize and um, it is possible probably to work with vanilla systems and, and just to get on with delivering um, as well. Um, I would say for this is that it also taught us what we already knew, uh, which is that we are much better asking our students what they want before we deliver it rather than after, um, because uh, I think if we had, we would have done it in a slightly different way. We weren't able to, but. So the uh, other advantage of COVID um, in our kind of uh, positive, uh, positive drive through the last year was uh, increased confidence in digital um, because we were all forced to do digital um, and an increased investment in technology. Um, so we, were, uh, we really hadn't got on very well with Teams before COVID. We were trying to use it as a way of um, bringing people together for team meetings without encouraging them to move across different sites, uh, given that we've got five libraries, didn't work very well. Um, the, the tech was kind of very uh, glitchy and also that we could even, you know, we couldn't hear the person on the other end or they couldn't hear us. And there is a lesson there that um, hybrid online meetings don't work. Uh, but I can safely say we're all experts in uh, Teams, whether we want to be or not. And also with SharePoint as well, which was um, a innovation that was being uh, kind of rolled out across the university and then uh, seriously got adopted. COVID also helped us um, build a case for investment in our library management system um, that we were, uh, we'd kind of put forward a proposal for the library management system that was being mulled over. It got agreed. People could see that actually the, the digital entry into the library was so important and um, investment in uh, software that provided uh, improved offsite access to resources. Um, which we're just working through at the moment. Uh, we got an investment in to deliver more online resources. Um, and so you'll see here that a kind of a quick shot of uh, our digital newspapers. I think they were definitely the last bastion of print resources. Um, and we've uh, got investment in to move to, to that and to lots of other digital resources. 
Um, we had got funding for a digital viewer for our archives and library manage, uh, sorry, our archives um, management system. And it would have been really easy for the university to decide to pause that as we were kind of having a regroup on our finances. But in fact, um, we, in fact, everything that we were doing just really kind of justified the need for that and the need to provide access to those um, special collections and archival resources uh, in a digital way as we weren't able to let our researchers on site for kind of great big chunks of the year. We'd also been in a discussion um, with our Faculty of Arts and Humanities about a digital humanities hub. And we were able to significantly move that forward this year. Again, it's just the realization that digital was the way to go, I would say, um, unlocked some of these things for us. Uh, and the other picture you can see there is the arrival of our, our lovely shiny new um, digitization unit. There was, I think, also a increased uh, kind of realization that the library was one of the key areas of digital delivery. Um, and importantly, I think that we could speak in confidence in this area and that we had particular insight into the needs of our users. Um, many other libraries got increased investment in online resources, um, so we weren't the only ones. Um, but it did allow for, it did also allow us to have some shift in our investment. Um, from print to online. So an example is our law department, who we were having a kind of a relatively um, uh, heated discussion with around their kind of uh, insistence on print resources. Uh, they did finally manage to let go of uh, the print collections in order to invest in the digital. Um, and I know that other libraries introduced uh, online reading lists. We'd already had the uh, agreement for that investment. Um, uh, but because of COVID, I really do think that uh, the increased digital literacy across the whole of the university has been beneficial for us. So we've seen a large increase in the number of reading lists that um, uh, we've managed to get onto the system. Um, and without any uh, taking away from all of the hard work of the team in order in, in how they've delivered that, I think that kind of realisation of, um, again, that digital was the way to go has made that easier for us. Um, and it would have taken quite a lot of per per persuasion. So we've had really good take up across across the um, across the university. I'd say with uh, probably actually just uh, the exception of the Faculty of Medicine, who in fairness have been a little bit busy. Which takes me on to kind of resilience and, and stamina. So there is no doubt that COVID has been a test of resilience. And quite frankly, stamina, there has been an awful lot to do on top of normal, um, normal business. It's been relentless, it's been hard. Uh, it's been incredibly tiring doing everything remotely. Um, and I think actually stamina is kind of key to that and how we maintain our stamina. And I know resilience is um, part of your next talk, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to cover this in, in too much detail. But I do think one of the joys of the crisis is how um, as a team we've pulled together and supported each other. So I just wanted to kind of um, cover a couple of things that we've done um, and examples of what happened. So one of, uh, one of the things that we did was have our, our lockdown awards. So what you can see on screen is our um, lovely member of staff, Nikki. And these are taken from her, uh, from her Twitter account, who um, allowed her daughter to shave her head uh, when she, got, uh, she uh, decided that she'd had enough of it and the hairdressers weren't open. And Nikki was the winner of our Feed El Sassoon Award. Um, you should also uh, have a look at her Twitter account because she did a wonderful video where uh, she covered, uh, changed the lyrics to uh, Sinead O'Connor's Nothing Compares to You um, and to a COVID song, uh, a lockdown song, and it's definitely worth a view. Um, so it's a, a lovely little bit of uh, social media there. Uh, the team created a virtual staff room to allow for those kind of, you know, coffee room and uh, water cooler encounters. Um, and that actually meant that we, rather than having, when we've had five libraries, that we could join up people across the library service and also invite other people to join us there. We've got regular quiz. There is currently a sea shanty competition running. I have no idea why. Uh, all I know is that Prosecco is involved heavily somewhere along the line of that. Um, and that we got really good at doing virtual everything. So um, virtual cards, advent calendars, uh, you name it, we can now do it virtually. Um, so the team have really been very ingenious in um, what they have managed to deliver to keep themselves and each other going. 
And uh, really that's something that we want to hold on to as we move forward. So during COVID, it's felt like a lot of choices have been taken away from us. Um, and in a way, our services have felt a little bit like Hobson's choice. You either kind of take it or you leave it. Um, and having no choice is generally seen as a bad thing, but I think that um, there are some positive attributes to it. Uh, COVID has meant that we've had to be bold, and that we've had to have a go, and that we've had to let go. Um, we've definitely had to be resilient and work better as a team. And I think that's true um, of us as a team, both in our organizations, but also across the sector. So um, we've really shared a lot uh, with each other across the sector and work together to, to help us all kind of get through this. So the crisis has provided us with an opportunity and I think we need to make sure we opt to take it rather than leave it. Thank you so much, Anna. That echoed enormously with the experience that I recognise from, from my university, but it's really interesting to hear the, the specifics of, of how Southampton have dealt with it and, and, and the detail. The, uh, the poetry, the ref poetry, I think is <laughs> inspired. The, lead, the last thing that people would normally associate with ref is a, is a bit of poetry, so, so I think that's fantastic. And the blanket was great as well. But I'm going to uh, bypass uh, Chair's prerogative to, to ask all the questions and ask the, <laughs> hear the questions that have come up through the chat. Lucy uh, asks, did the upping the digitization service mean needing to train up additional staff? And if this so, was so, was it done remotely or did it happen when staff were back on campus? Um, so we, we, we had a vacancy in our digitization team. So uh, we were able to, to fill that, uh, but it did mean that we had to train up that member, member of staff. And um, we did that at the point where we were able to allow some staff to return to campus. So we didn't do it remotely. Um, but we did have to increase our, uh, we were running, as I say, with a vacancy and that had been okay. Uh, but then suddenly we, we did have to fill that. Super, thank you. Uh, Ruth wonders, could you say a little more about the quality control of online inquiries? You said you increased the, the number of staff who were dealing with that. Yeah, so, yeah, certainly. Um, so, so we had been we had been thinking about the best way to to make sure that we were getting the kind of the best answers to the queries that were that were coming through, and certainly what we had seen um, because we have a uh, inquiry management system that there was some variability. Um, so we kind of used this as an opportunity to really uh, kind of dig through those answers to those in, those inquiries and provide some kind of peer mentoring support. Um, so that's operated in a kind of number of different ways. Um, so sometimes that has been a kind of direct feedback from one of the uh, line managers to somebody where they felt that there's kind of either been a gap in understanding or a training requirement. But it's also meant that in some cases um, that somebody's had a kind of uh, a person shadow them. Um, and so they've both answered, they both had a practice at kind of answering the same question together to see whether their responses would have been different. And we've had really good feedback on that. So I think partly because it's kind of um, a form of kind of um, peer review, but you're both doing it together. So it's not somebody judging your the quality of your answer, but you're both giving an answer and you're both uh, discussing why you gave that answer. Uh, that's been really successful. And we've had some lovely feedback from the team about how helpful that is. And I think in general that people have actually appreciated the, the fact that uh, somebody has taken the time to to spend with them on kind of that kind of positive feedback on their responses as well, which we don't we don't we don't often get. I think you know quite often we're just delivering. We don't necessarily get that that the praise that comes with that as well. Um, really interesting approach. It's one that I yeah. take teaching literature searching to colleagues who are joining the team, and we do a search together and say, oh, oh I yeah. haven't thought of that word, and, and we learn from each other as well as. But to do it within the online inquiries, really, I think that's great. Kate wonders, do you think there's a desire from users for us to retain online space bookings after the return to normality? I, yes, I think there is, there is some. So where we saw a real difference in um, depending on the type of users. Um, so certainly our undergraduates really don't like online booking. 
Um, I think that's really been clear. And we have two spaces open on our main campus. Um, so one's the library and one is a kind of a general learning space. And uh, I think what we found is they kind of fated with their feet. So they, they would prefer to just turn up and go into that learning space. Um, unless they particularly had to come to the library for, for resources, which uh, was an interesting lesson to us. And we didn't really have much option, but to introduce our online, uh, our online booking space. Whereas our postgraduates um, were very keen on the online um, booking space uh, and it gave us actually really kind of detailed fee feedback about what they needed. And so we have different types of different, different um, online spaces, different spaces have different slots al allocated to them. So we have one floor of the library that has three hour slots, other floors of the library that are only one hour slot. And certainly what we can see through our bookings software is that our postgraduates want longer slots, that uh, they uh, like to book in advance, uh, they're, they're in the quiet part of the library, and uh, I think they would actually really quite like to, to keep that going, to know that they can turn up at the library, there'll be a space available for them. Um, so, so it may well be um, that it is something that we, we continue with. We had done some online booking during exam time, um, but I think that what we're seeing is that it's particularly for postgrads, it's not limited just to exam time. Uh, so it's a different approach. Yeah. Is it LibCal that you're using for the booking or is it a different sort of thing? Yes. Well, we had been using LibCal when we were doing a kind of small amount of booking for exam periods, but it just wasn't scalable um, and it didn't deliver what we needed it to deliver. So we moved to Microsoft bookings, which is also um, quite restrictive, uh, uh, but somehow we have made it work. And I think, I think that was kind of um, my point is that we're so used to customizing and to, to making everything exactly as we want it, um, but it is possible to just live with what you've got and to and to accept that it, um, that it may be that it's not not everything that you want it to be, but it does mean that it's kind of more manageable going forward. I don't know about other people, but we do have an ongoing problem about uh, kind of really in-depth customizations, and then every time we want to update something. It becomes a real a kind of a real issue because it's so deeply customized it's not easy to do i absolutely hear that <laughs> we're all so special yeah <laughs> I, I work in Cambridge. my goodness we're all so special yeah. <laughs> right, I am. Yes. really interesting point about about that uh, a related question to that is do you get a high number of students booking a space and not turning up um, not really. Uh, so there is there is some not turning up, but I would say uh, that the majority of bookings do do take place. Okay. So I know that some other library services kind of have put in a kind of buffer, so they kind of provide spaces, you know, by more than twenty percent. Um, we haven't done that, and in general, um, I, I don't think it has been an issue for us. I'm sure that some people don't turn up. More of an issue has been the fact that. Um, that either our students kind of don't really know what they, it's the kind of pre-planning, I think. So they may book for an hour, but actually decide that they want to stay for, for two, two hours or that they may, um, they may turn up early for a booking or they may turn up halfway through a booking. And again, the, the system's ability to flex isn't great. Um, we've been able to do that in a manual way, um, I think, so we we're kind of able to accommodate those students. Um, but yeah, I think that I think it's more that that they kind of turned up at a different time rather than not at all. Thank you. Um, Alison wonders, could you say more about why you feel that hybrid online meetings don't work? Yes. Um, so I think when we had tried this as a team, so we what we were trying to do was, as we had five libraries, um, try and connect across our sites for, for different team meetings. And certainly our experience is that the, the person who was in the online, online room always uh, felt disadvantaged. It was very difficult for, uh, for it to read any kind of body language, for them to interrupt, quite often sometimes to hear them, um, for them to feel like they're fully part of the conversation. Moving everything into an online space means that you're all using the same online tools and you're all um, kind of equally advantaged or disadvantaged, depending on what your view of that online space is. And I, I think increasingly that we think if we're going to um, if we're going to have I think we really, we definitely do want um, to meet to meet each other in person. I think we're quite desperate to do that at this stage. Um, but that actually, if we are trying to to move into uh, try to continue to work in that way, where we're able to connect people from from different locations, 
that we will be we will need to do that where we're all online and that could be a little bit odd because we could have people sharing sharing offices we're in the same meeting but both online um but i i don't think it is possible unless uh, the tech kind of greatly improves or maybe our kind of the tech that we have in particular greatly improves to get away from that disadvantage that the person who's online feels when other people are actually physically together i know it's certainly something that we're looking at because we, we don't have the the screens and the webcams and to have two or three people joining online to to a, a group who are in the room so we we just need we are missing some of the the tech to to make it happen for us to to optimize yeah. it but but interesting yeah it is yeah we, we've all had the experience of the 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 person dialing in on a phone to join a meeting and we know how problematic that can be because there's so much interruption and there's cross talking because they can't see now we've got the added benefit of, of more visual options and yet still the the body language is, is a bit of an issue yeah and i think we see that when um you know for very good reasons people don't aren't able to turn on their the webcam yeah. um, that you can you know you kind of rely on somebody to to, to use their kind of virtual hand because you can't see that they're desperately trying to to yeah. interrupt the conversation keith wonders a uh, He's interested to know more about where the investment for, for digital came from. Um, suddenly the money trees have appeared. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we knew that forest existed. Yes, I know, uh, which is great. So we did um, we did bid for extra funds. So we had a kind of an emergency COVID fund for want of a better term within the university. And I know um, that we were particularly lucky to have that and it's not everybody else's experience, but we were able um, to bid for funding for things that were essential to the delivery of kind of services during, uh, particularly during the lockdown when we were working remotely. To say that we uh, we went for it, so we did everything we possibly could to get as much money as we as we could um, during that period, um, because uh, our other experience has been very much about kind of restricting budgets as well. So um, so we bid and I think I think again it's that kind of point about people could suddenly were able to kind of switch to understanding that library was a, a digital entity as well as a physical one. So very much kind of a focus on buildings um, and that online delivery. And a part of that was that it made us much easier I think not only were we able to get um, some additional digital resources and then to argue to keep those but we were also having discussions about um, some VAT returning money, um, which was coming back into our institution, but was going back into a central port rather than into the library. I know it's very annoying. Um, and we had that reallocated back to us in order to kind of support some of what we wanted to do as well, because um, I think it would just, you know, the need was seen as obvious. Um, but, but it did, I think, when we were putting together business cases for other digital innovations that, it was just much easier to explain it just all of it became much more easy to explain when you're saying that you know a vast majority of our users are, are not coming in through the door uh, anyway in a normal in normal circumstances and particularly won't be for quite some time um that it was just easier to argue the case yeah yeah if we can't argue it now my goodness when can yeah. we? <laughs> yeah. pgb 70 asks have you been getting more complaints from students about noise given the lighter staff present presence? And going forward, we may need to rely more on self-policing of spaces to maintain good behavior. Yeah, so, um, well, we kind of, kind of related to noise. So what we did get was lots of complaints about not, um, not following the guidelines. So in particular, kind of, you know, they, um, were not wearing their face masks or when they were seeing each other uh, particularly as we were returning to campus kind of hugging each other um, and it became very problematic because I think our students were um, were often kind of grouping together and we're then saying but we're in a household bubble and there's no way of kind of proving or, or disproving that and so we did have to take some action um, and we tried, uh, so we tried various different things. Um, we had student ambassadors, which were uh, working across the university to um, uh, kind of early on in uh, kind of when we first returned and that was allowed. So kind of um, who were just reiterating the rules across campus and being there to support students and very much that kind of, you know, peer support. 
and we asked if we could draw them into the library so they're very much outside um, and the risk assessment that had been done for them was about them staying outside we asked if they could come and help us in the library with that um, with managing some of that behavior and we kind of redid the risk assessments to allow them to do that and that was really really successful uh, because there's nothing quite like that kind of peer pressure um, to help uh, when when term ended and the kind of second lockdown came we weren't able to do that and our students weren't able to return to campus and so we moved um, and then more of our staff were working off site so we had more security presence in the library to allow us to keep our opening hours and what we did was move some of those security presence to uh, actually walking around the library to um, to reiterate that message I have to say that's that's really successful although we did have to do to kind of be a little bit sneaky so we had um our security staff were kind of started patrolling once an hour and we're kind of realizing that i think with the best will in the world what our students were doing were they'd kind of have their face masks up they're allowed to eat and drink in the library they take the face mask down to eat and drink and forget to put it back up again um so we had to kind of introduce that we'd have the first security guard going around and then five minutes later the next security guard going around and they're really having to kind of pace when they were coming because our students were kind of otherwise um, kind of working around their, their schedules uh, and we've been keeping stats on that and it has uh, compliance has really got a huge amount better as we've done that um, well we're thinking about what we're going to do after Easter and we're increasing our opening hours again we have uh, opted to keep a security guard to help us with that um, that reiteration of the the kind of compliance as well so, so it could either be kind of student peer support they were trained really well not by us actually by student services or security guard would be the way to go for that Jane from Anglia Ruskin says that they've had a similar positive experience with student ambassadors so I think that's a, that point about peer peer pressure is a, is a really strong one yeah. Sarah asks have you seen a requirement for more desk space from students than has been physically available clearly we've we've all got a chair graveyard somewhere in, the, in our buildings where, where we've sort of got them stashed up and, and reduced the, to maintain social distancing, but has that been a problem? No, we haven't, um, we haven't ma uh, maxed out the capacity of our, of our buildings on any of our, um, any of our libraries so far. I think that is probably because we have the, have an alternative study space, particularly at um, the main campus, which has been kind of very busy. Um, but so far we haven't, which I think was a surprise to us because certainly we, what we heard from other colleagues in other libraries was that uh, they had reached capacity. Um, so I think it's interesting that, that we didn't. Uh, certainly once the weather improved, we have seen um, this year much more, many more students return to campus. And I think what we're preparing for is that we would have increased um, student numbers back on campus next year, uh, sorry, after Easter. But we did also kind of put a pop up tents across campus and other other kind of study spaces as well. Um, so I think they've got a range of options. So I think we've been a little bit lucky there, really. Fantastic. I don't know if this is a loaded question, but Rick from Southampton asks, <laughs> <laughs> what long term changes might we see in the university sector as a whole as a result of COVID? Are we likely to see education delivered entirely online, online from traditional physical universities? And if so, um, it could have a big impact on the international student market and on the physical environment on campus. So it's quite a, a quite involved. What big long term changes do you think you're going to see? I, I think um, I think blended learning is definitely going to stay with us as we as we move forward. Um, and I think you know it'd be interesting to see what your your speaker says um, later about that. I can definitely see I can definitely see that sticking with us for for quite some time. Um, I think that realization that the digital environment is as important as the physical will probably stay with us as well. That what we've seen kind of across the sector is a mass investment in space and place. Um, I think I think for our students that study space is still important, but we may we may see that there is uh, that digital space that movement to digital space then kind of affects some other change. Um, so certainly at Southampton, we don't really have very many part-time students. Um, and the expectation has been that people will come to campus. And I think that it certainly will see that changing, that we'll probably see a kind of greater provision of part-time courses because we're able to, to think about a different delivery mode um, as well. Um, so what other big changes do I think? 
I'm really hoping that we'll see some big changes around um, our kind of open access on the basis of what kind of what's happened. Um, I think that would be a real loss of opportunity if we aren't able to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Recognise that. Um, John makes a comment, more online or distance learning could, could help staff and students and it might be affected by, a, I mean, international students might be affected by immigration policies. Obviously, there's, there's lots of external things going on that, that could be affecting life. Really, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so we we have a very large um, international kind of postgraduate cohort, and when we talk to them about blended and online learning, um, that they they were very keen as part of their experience to come to the UK. So it wasn't really so. It, it's partly around the delivery of the course, uh, but actually it was the whole experience that went with it. And I, so I think that that's interesting, particularly when we're thinking about international students. So. The, as ever, kind of going to university isn't all about the course that you're taking. It's also about the experience that ca that comes with it. And so I think that will be interesting to see. About, yeah, yeah. The the MBA course in that's run in Cambridge. So much of it is about the networking that happens and the the physical experience of being in in the Cambridge environment and and what that brings. And you can't deliver that online. You can't have no. those chats over a, a college dinner or, or those meetings in the pub or whatever it is that you you have. It's so much harder to do online. Yes. Yeah, and I, I think that, um, kind of as I said, that for our students, although they were having online delivery, they still wanted to do that together. Um, so they wanted to sit and watch the lecture together and participate together. Which, again, interesting. Another space question, just to, to round us off. Julie wonders, have you had to uh, fit more charging points or have sockets fitted? And maybe associated with that, have you had to facilitate more spaces for people to have online tutorials in the library? You talked about interesting use of space, maybe yes. in the future. Yes, yeah, so we did um, We did manage to do some work to the building while we were, were closed because we still had our state's colleagues uh, in and so there was still, we were still allowed to do that and we did fit more PowerPoints um, into our main library and took the opportunity to do that and also to, to do redecoration and other bits and pieces uh, which was kind of helpful. Um, and I, we've definitely seen a demand for small group study space. We haven't been able to facilitate that. We do, we already had some small groups that study space but the ventilation issues in our building meant that we couldn't open those up um so so we did we did kind of have some additional tents added to campus uh, they were really weren't very popular and i think because they were they were pretty um grim spaces but actually they didn't have charging and powerpoints uh, which i think tells you an awful lot about um kind of what's important to our students so ubiquitous Wi-Fi, power and charging points, and uh, that sense of kind of bumping into each other as well. I think that kind of sociability of the space. Um, I definitely last question, because I know that you're, we've got a very limited amount of your, your a, a fantastic, an hour, which is fantastic. Um, Onkelman uh, wonders, did you supply or loan laptops to students who are not, who didn't have suitable tech of their own or were relying on library PCs? And do you have any plans to expand that uh, in the future? Yes, yeah, so we had just introduced laptop loans um, uh, in the library when we went into lockdown. Um, and because we, we exited quite quickly, uh, quite a lot of our laptops that then went out to, to staff to use as well. Um, we've just been in the process of kind of um, reintroducing that service uh, with quarantining and all of those, those sorts of things. And also changing the system, which was very much kind of, you know, short term loan in the library to long term loan outside of the library. But we did get additional funding as part of that COVID fund for additional laptop lockers as well. And we did work with our student services to argue for more funds um, for subsidizing uh, uh, students getting access to funds for digital equipment. Um, so that's managed through student services and, um, but we, were, we helped them write the paper in order to kind of justify that spend. So I would say that, yes, uh, we, we will be supplying laptop loans to students. We've just kind of finished out the last of the tech issue. And we have extended it. And we have also increased that provision. And then one of the things that we're looking at with our, um, we had to close all of our IT labs, which wasn't a bad thing. They're really grim. 
um, and you know, kind of you know, very packed, very smelly. Um, and uh, we've been in discussion with our head of our IT department about actually our IT provision going forward in the library, and about how we move more to a kind of laptop culture and how we support that through through the university, um, through kind of uh, supporting students who can't afford those themselves but also the kind of the tech that they would need in order to use them here, which could be docking stations, those sorts of things. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time this morning. That was fascinating. There was lots of uh, parts of your talk that really chimed with the experience that, that I've had. I'm sure that's the case for, for most of the, the people attending, but also really interesting to hear the different and the innovative and the bold solutions. And I love that there was a bold, you're looking to, to make take real advantage of this and yeah the, the boldness of the, the solution that you were you were introducing. I'm delighted that this year we're able to be making charity donations to all of our lovely speakers uh, to the charity of their choice and I believe it's Donkey Sanctuary who's going to be receiving the benefit of a uh, of your choice for, for you so thank you very much for speaking to us we'll be looking forward to to, to giving a, a, a donation's worth of, of carrots or whatever it is to the Donkey Sanctuary if that's, if that's required. So thank you it was <laughs> fascinating many thank many you so, thanks. thank you so much it's been a real pleasure and thank you for such interesting questions and i hope you enjoy the rest of your day thank you enjoy yours thank much. you bye nice to see you